Yeah. Right. This meeting is being recorded. Thank you. Um, so welcome to uh, the fifth lecture in this uh, mini course on concurrent programming. Uh, today, this uh, speaker is Dr. Devi Prasad Nasahu. He is assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, IIT Roorkee. Uh, he worked in the performance modeling team of MD CPUs uh, at AMD Bangalore. He holds PhD uh, from the School of Electrical Sciences, Computer Sciences at uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Bhubaneswar and a master's degree from CSE IIT Madras. His research interests lie in memory systems and GPUs with respect to verification and performance studies. He has several IEEE and ACM publications. And today he is going to talk to us about the modeling and verification of cache coherence protocols. Um, over to you, Dr. Devi Prasad. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, uh, Professor uh, Rupesh. Yeah, so uh, we will be discussing about cache coherence protocols, uh, modeling and verification challenges. So uh, before that, uh, let me give you a brief uh, intro to our lab. So this is uh, research at uh, Intelligent Systems Lab at uh, IITR. So here we focus on, uh, it's an interdisciplinary lab where we are working on uh, uh, computer architecture, machine learning, and uh, natural language processing. So we, uh, we generally work on different stuff here. So I uh, focus mostly on the computer architecture side. So where uh, look at uh, the 3D stack caches, the next generation 3D stack caches and the coherence protocols uh, associated with CPU and GPU systems. And then also I, I also look at uh, GPU front end pipeline, uh, uh, architecture of the GPU front end pipeline where, uh, so, both these stuff, I mostly look at uh, modeling and verification and uh, formal modeling verification and performance side and performance verification side. Apart from that, uh, Professor uh, uh, Pravendra Singh and uh, Raksha Sharma, they work on machine learning and natural language processing. And uh, we do have some collaborative project where we work on ML for computer architecture and uh, uh, computer architecture for ML and NLP uh, stuff. So, yeah, so, so we should jump into uh, the, today's agenda, uh, which is uh, regarding cash coherence protocols. Yeah. Uh, so, let's talk about the memory hierarchy first of a heterogeneous computing system. Uh, this is blocking the view. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let's talk about the uh, heterogeneous uh, um, memory system. So where you have a CPU and you have a GPU and uh, how is that getting connected to the memory, CPU and GPU. And uh, this is your main memory. Uh, so typically this, this the, the architecture that I'm showing here is a kind of a integrated GPU architecture. So CPU has its own instruction cache. Uh, so let's say this is CPU zero, CPU one. They have their own data caches. The instruction cache is also partitioned, and they have L two cache, which is uh, share, uh, which is shared between the instruction and uh, data cache typically. But in this diagram, we are seeing that uh, it's shared among uh, the CPUs. Typically, the L three cache is uh, shared across all the CPUs. So similarly on the GPU side, we have uh, different uh, compute units. So these are called compute units or streaming multiprocessors. Compute unit is the terminology used for uh, uh, Intel and AMD uh, GPUs and uh, streaming multiprocessors are the terminologies used for uh, NVIDIA GPUs. So they are the major uh, compute units. They are the major processing uh, elements on the GPU. And then uh, the L1 cache of the GPU, which is other, otherwise known as the texture cache per pipeline. Uh, and then uh, there is a texture cache per channel. Uh, why do they name it uh, per channel? Is that uh, they are mostly mem side cache. I mean, uh, you the cache is connected to the memory side. Uh, the addressing is done via the uh, channel number. So, uh, 
and they are kind of distributed so it's it's the l2 cache on the gpu side is kind of a distributed memory side cache so it is termed as texture cache per uh, channel and uh, then they connect over the system bus uh, which might be a bus or it might be an interconnect uh, to the uh, global memory controller and uh, the directory which is responsible for coherence between the cpu and the gpu we'll talk about the uh, directory and uh, the coherence internal coherence of the cpu and gpu in bit more detail uh, but uh, what i wanted to show here is like how is the cpu organized as well as how is the gpu organized and how is uh, that uh, in an integrated gpu how is the connection being done between the cpu gpu and the memory controller okay so yeah before jumping into more details about uh, coherence uh, maybe uh, we should just look at uh, just kind of refresh our uh, mindset uh, with respect to uh, the cache architecture the basic cache architecture so what is cache data in the cache is a subset of data in the main memory right so if we have some data in the main memory we want to pull it into the cache so that our access latency is going to reduce uh, so whatever data is present inside the cache is always a subset of the data which is present in the main memory unit of data access in cache is block or line so when we say that we have a block of data typically it is around 64 byte so this is the unit of transaction that is happening between the memory controller or uh, the main memory and the cache uh, so mostly in all the major uh, cpu side uh, caches the data size the block size is typically 64 byte so that means that 64 bytes of data gets transacted uh, upon a cache miss uh, from the memory to the cache and the corresponding number on the gpu side is typically 128 byte that's because the locality shown by the gpu application is uh, more sensitive towards 128 byte of data uh, now each cache block is tracked with the memory addresses which are otherwise known as tags so if you look at the diagram on the right this is a four way set associative cache so one two three and four ways and each of these four ways have got the data array and the tag array so each block each entry is a block and each row is a um, is a kind of set in one set you have four ways so it's four ways set associative cache and then you can match the tag and get out the line whichever is a hit so at a given point of time you should have only one hit for a particular set to be working properly so now this tag is the tag which represents the data in the main memory oh sorry represent the address in the main memory so the corresponding data is stored here uh, so now given the tags and the data we also have some control information and this control informations are stored in terms of states of the cache block in a single uh, level cache and a single core or uh, one core uh, cache you have three states of a cache data it can be valid it can be invalid it can be modified so we'll look at we'll slowly go through building uh, the state machine from scratch so now uh, just to introduce what is coherence uh, i think uh, in the previous lectures uh, uh, dr kalyan might have introduced this so you have uh, multiple uh, cores which have their own private caches and they are sharing particular data items so for example x is a data item which is present in one of the cache line and that is brought that is brought in by one of the processor now the other processor also wants to use the same 
data line x so it can also pull it pull in the data line from the memory now all is fine until they are reading the uh, data item the moment someone starts using it or updating it or writing into it that is the point when issue started starts occurring because the write is not visible to the other code so to get around this problem we introduce coherence protocols so this problem of inconsistency that is happening in the data item because of sharing can be termed as coherence problem so now in uh, so to get around this problem we have coherence protocol now there can be different kind of reasons for coherence uh, scenario to come into play the first thing first thing is tracking of data state in different level of memory so that means that if you have a l1 cache or an l2 cache what is the state of the data it is is it valid invalid or some other state so what is the state of the data in different level of cache it might be in one state in one of the uh, one level l1 cache it might be a different uh, it might be in a different state in uh, the next level which might be the l2 cache or it might be a, in a different state in l3 cache so we need to have a protocol which need to specify that which combination of states should be correct now the other thing which is important is data sharing in a multi core cache coherence protocol in a multi core cache coherence scenario you need to have data sharing enabled for any coherence scenario to play similarly if there is code sharing also i mean your instruction sharing then also uh, coherence protocols comes into play the this sharing is because mainly because of allowing multi threading now when you have two different threads which which are running and they are accessing different memory locations it might so happen that they might start accessing the same data item for example in this is this particular image uh, x1 is used by processor 0 and it is also used by processor 1 now this could be because of multi threading because you might be running two different threads and they might be running on two different cores then they might be accessing the same memory location that's why this kind of scenario is coming into play okay so that can be taken care of by coherence protocols another reason of uh, getting into coherence scenario is enabling private caches imagine that everything would have been shared so if all the cores would have been having uh, sharing the uh, whatever cache is there it would have been sharing all the cores would have been sharing the cache then this scenario might not have come in but since you have private caches one core will have so let's say let's assume that you have two cores and one of the core is having both the cores are having l1 cache as private then only this kind of scenario comes in if they would have had a shared uh, cache then this kind of scenario won't have come in and of course uh, reads and writes now what we need to optimize here is the traffic is the memory traffic in order to reduce pressure on the shared caches so that's the goal of designing a good coherence protocol uh then coming to the types of multi threaded workloads by workload we mean uh, we mean uh, applications typically the database workloads are the applications which have got a uh, lot of data and uh, code sharing uh, database workload in sense oracle or otherwise it is called as tpcc or mysql or i have some spelling mistake it's mongodb mongodb uh, so all the kinds of database workload they have got lot of data sharing uh, similarly uh, virtual machines jvm uh, hypervisors they also have lot of data sharing uh, 
scientific benchmarks like parsec benchmark shoot splash benchmark shoot uh, have got um, uh, data sharing similarly graph processing applications like a google map and uh, graphics workloads like games movie players and many more they have significant amount of data sharing so in these data sharing uh, scenarios and multi threading scenarios we encounter coherence uh, product uh, we in, uh, encounter coherence problems so we need to design a coherence protocol and of course designing a coherence protocol is not so trivial so it becomes a bit complex as uh, the number of cores increases as number of, as the number of features increases so we need to have a robust verification design verification strategy for that so we are going to look at that in little more details okay so coming to the coherence domain so by domain uh, here i mean that where are uh, coherence protocols uh, where, in which part of the system the coherence protocol should be taken care of uh, so we'll go through them one by one so first is what is a read only cache uh, the coherence of or the states of uh, a read only cache can be tracked with two different states one is valid state and other is invalid state okay so uh, effectively the valid bit of a cache takes care of it one of the uh, most uh, common example of this kind of cache is your instruction cache a uh, second type is your write through cache it is similar to a read only cache uh, you can track the states using valid and invalid and the writes actually because th those are write through uh, you don't need any extra bit to represent the change in the data item and examples of such caches are gpu l1 caches we look at the state machines of uh, this write through cache and write back cache in more details our uh, next is write back cache the coherence is tracked using uh, three states valid clean valid modified and invalid uh, so valid clean and valid modified uh, valid bit and modified bits uh, of the cache actually take care of these three different states uh so typically you can say that a single core cpu cache is implemented using write back cache you can imagine a single core cpu uh with these three states to enable write back caches then as we go to multi level caches we need to understand three different types one is uh, three different properties that is one is inclusivity second is exclusivity and third is inclusive design we are going to discuss this three in little more details but before that i am going to talk about uh the other two scenarios which uncommon scenarios where the coherence pr protocols comes into play one is simultaneous multi threading so in simultaneous multi threading what happens is like you are running two different threads on the same core now if you are running two different threads on the same core what might happen is that there will be data sharing between the two threads so your caches the data which will be present in your caches uh, for example your l1 data cache or l2 data cache which might be even private because of the threading scenario because of the separate load uh, store uh, queues and the partitioning of the load store queues in the core you might see a coherence problem there okay because of the private nature of the uh, load store queues you will see a coherence problem there so to deal around this problem we can use the thread id or uh, the hardware thread id the simultaneous multi threader uh, thread id to distinguish for which particular data item this uh, this particular block belongs to for which particular thread this particular data item belongs to so yeah so basically extension of a single uh, multi core system into a single core which is a very uncommon scenario sharing on the same core so your coherence domain can be in the single core by itself 
uh, then going into sharing between instruction and data cache. So sometimes there are some code which are otherwise known as self-modifiable code. And in our past experience, I saw that uh, uh, um, PPCC typically has a lot of self-modifiable code. Uh, so there is a sharing between the instruction and the data cache lines. So in that sense, you need to have, you need to maintain a coherence between the instruction cache and the data cache of the CPU. And uh, of course, multi-core, multiple CPU sharing the data item. So the coherence domain is definitely there. Uh, then between the cores, that means the CPUs and the devices, IO devices. So you need to maintain a coherence between the CPU and the IO devices, why? Because that because of the some because of some optimizations where you try to pull in data from the I/O devices directly into the last level cache. So if you are pulling data directly from the device to the last level cache bypassing the memory, then you have to maintain coherence between them. Because your memory is not updated, so you need to maintain coherence between the device and the core. Similarly. The last one, which is uh, between the core and the coprocessor or coprocessor here, mostly we are using GPUs. So you need to maintain coherence between the CPUs and the GPUs. Okay. So any doubts still now? Otherwise we'll start looking at the state machines of uh, write through, write back protocols in little more details. Okay, yeah, we'll probably more. Okay, so let's look at uh, a write through cache, which is configured at, as no allocate. So if you consider the heat scenario, there are two things that happens inside a cache, right? Uh, either the data can be hit or it can be missed. So if you are doing a write on the cache, and in the hit scenario, you have got two different options to configure the cache. One is to do write through, other is to do write back. With write through, what happens is, after even getting a hit, you just write the data through to the next level. So that means you send another request to the next level to update the next level of memory. And with miss, what happens is you have got two different options there also. You can go ahead with allocate or you can go ahead with no allocate. So by with allocate, what happens is if you even if you have a write miss, you kind of pull in the data from the memory and put it into the cache and update it. So that's allocate. And with no allocate, what you do is you just send out the request upon a write miss and forget it. So typically write through caches are uh, used with no allocate scenario because anyways you are writing through. So even if you have a miss, why to pull in the data again? Okay, so typically they are configured as write through with no allocate. Now let's look at the simplest of the state machine here that is happening with write through and no allocate. So you have got two different states, invalid and valid. So this can be represented using the valid bit. Now, invalid means that data is not present inside the cache. Valid means data is present inside the cache. If at invalid state, you are having a read or a write. So if, if it is a read or a write, so then what you are going to do is you're going to forward the request. Now upon a read response, you are going to install the line inside the cache and you are going to move into a valid state. At valid state, you might actually have another read. So you are going to respond. If you are doing a write, then you are going to write and update and forward because it's a write through protocol. Now at a valid state, if you are evicting, you just evict the line and go to an invalid state. Because the memory is already updated, you don't need to do anything. 
at invalid state, if, even if you get an evict signal, you are not going to do anything. So now this invalid and valid state is not a property of the cache line here. It is the property of a particular address in the main memory. You pick up any random address in the main memory and this state machine is valid for that particular address inside the cache. So that means if it is present inside the cache, it is valid. If it is not present inside the cache, it is invalid. It might sound very simple, but as, as you go on increasing the number of states in this because of the coherence, it might become little complex. So I would uh, say that please uh, understand that this particular state machine works for every address every address in the main memory. Now, whenever it is cached, it is valid. Whenever it is not cached, it is invalid. So based on that, you have different signals. Either it can be read or it can be write. Or it can be evict or it can be read response. So if you represent this as a state machine, if you represent this as a formal state machine, as uh, we know what is a DFA, deterministic finite automata, then Q will contain I and V. I think the pen might not be visible. One second. Still, it is working on the same and right on this side. So uh, Q will be either I or V. Then Sigma will be what? Read, write, read response. Or evict. Then the transition function can be represented using the state machine. Q0 is i, and f is both i and okay. So now let's look at the next type of cache, which is write back with allocate cache. In a write back with allocate cache, what happens is with a write, you do not send the write out to the next level. That means you have to remember that you have written into the cache. How are you going to remember that? Using a valid bit, sorry, using a dirty bit. Now this dirty bit, along with the valid bit forms the state machine. So this is the state machine. So you have three different states. One is invalid state, other is valid state, third is modified state. Now, as, as with the previous uh, state diagram, we still start with invalid state. There can be read or write, and you forward it to the next level. Upon a read response you have, you go into a valid state. At a valid state, you do, do read and respond. When you write onto it, you go into a modified state. And from a modified state, when you evict it, you go into I state. Either from modified state or valid state, you evict it, you go into a I state. So this is V or clean state. You can say this is as clean also. At a modified state, if you are going to read or write, if you are reading it, you are responding to the data item. If you are writing onto it, you are updating the line. Now, 
important to see here is that since it's a right allocate protocol from i state if you are going to have a uh, right miss and it is forwarded there will be a right allocate signal which is coming from which you, which will be coming from the next level of memory in that case also you need to install so for example read response was installing it into v state now write response will also install the line into modified state okay so now if we translate into this into formal language we will again receive this q as set as i b and m then q0 is again i f is again all the three i b and m transition function delta is uh, uh, given by the state machine and then uh, sigma is given by read write read response write response write allocate sorry and evict okay so far so good with a single level of cache now let's go into multiple hierarchical caches so you have three different types of organization of a hierarchical cache it can be an inclusive cache it can be an an uh, exclusive cache or it can be a non inclusive cache now in an inclusive cache what happens is like your l1 your first level cache is a subset of the next level of cache so here we are considering two caches l1 cache and uh, llc or last level cache or l2 cache you can i'll use the term in an exchanging manner l1 cache l2 cache sorry uh, l2 cache and llc llc means last level cache so if data in l1 cache is a subset of data in llc data in l1 is a subset of data in llc then it is a inclusive cache that means data all the data present in l1 cache is inclusive of the data present in the last level cache so how is the core request flowing when the request comes in if it is a hit in l1 cache it will be responded here if it is miss it will go down then when the responses come back it will fill both llc as well as l1 and whenever llc wants to evict something it has to send a back invalidation it has to send a back invalidation to not only evict the data from the llc but also from uh the l1 okay so that means that no data can be present in the llc but it is present in l1 that is inclusive hierarchy in a non inclusive hierarchy this back invalidation is relaxed which means that we can now have data this property that l1 is a subset of llc is now removed which means that we can have now some data which is present in l1 but not in llc and some amount of data which is present in llc not in l1 and some amount of data which is present in both so in that case also the core request path actually remains the same whereas the eviction path is changed where when you evict something from the last level cache you do not send a back invalidation so this is non inclusive hierarchy then the third kind of uh, hierarchy which is used is called exclusive cache hierarchy which means that content of l1 is completely different from the content of llc so the data present in l1 
is completely different from the L, uh, data present in LLC. So there cannot be any shared line. There can be no lines which will be present both in L1 cache and the LLC cache. So how is the core uh, request flowing? When there is a L1 cache miss and LLC cache miss and memory is supplying the data, now you do not install the line into LLC. You don't put the line into the last level cache. You put the line into the L1 cache. Upon eviction from the L1 cache, only you put the line into the LLC. And when you evict from LLC, it is gone. You don't talk to the L1 from there on. So in this way, you maintain exclusivity. So here we kind of understood that there are two different properties, even if this is not even with respect to multi-core scenario, even if there are two different levels of cache, in order to maintain the relationship between the data in these two levels of cache, you have to follow either inclusivity property or exclusivity property. I keep uh, telling this term property because I'm going to tell you how is this term property and all those things are very useful as we try to do verification. Now let's jump to multi-core cache coherence protocols. In a multi-core coherence protocol, there are two types of protocols that are typically used based on the type of network that we are using for connection of the cores. The two types of protocols are Snoopy based coherence protocol and directory based coherence protocol. Now, assume that there are multiple processors and there are multiple um, private caches attached to each of these processors. If you are looking at the left hand side figure, and then there is a bus which is connecting. Can we go into mute? Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, uh, should be fine. Okay. Uh, so you have the bus, which is connecting all the private caches and the cores, and the memory is also connected to the same bus. Now, as you are trying to do coherence here, that means that data sharing here. So like, for example, if P1 is supposed to share the data with Pn, then the transactions have to pass via this bus. All the transactions, all the sharing transactions, as well as normal cash miss transactions are going to go via this bus. So we can implement snooping. What do we mean by snooping? It's other name of listening. We can implement a snooping based protocol where one processor can hear what is happening on the other processor? What is happening on the other processor uh, by listening to the transactions? So it typically uses two different types of protocols, which is called write invalidate protocol or write update protocol. We'll slowly go into this, but let's look at the other variant which is more commonly used variant in a large multi-core scenario. A bus-based protocol is very common in the systems where the number of cores are less. For example, two cores or four cores, or maximum it can go to like eight cores. But even with eight cores, it is very difficult to design a coherence protocol, which will use the bus architecture. If you are using a interconnection network, then it is better to use a directory based coherence protocol where the directory is stored. You can say that this is the directory and these are the caches, private caches. The directory is supposed to store the information 
uh, the directory is available with the shared cache and it is supposed to store information the state information not the data the state information of the lines which are presented uh, which are present with the private cache so the directory kind of acts as a filter to approximate the states of the cores or the uh, of the cores containing the line in the private cache so that means that let's say there are two different cores core 0 and core 1 they have their own private cache this is their private cache uh, this is the private cache of core 0 this is the private cache of core 1 and let's say there is this there is a shared cache which is connected over an interconnection network now what happens is like you at the at the shared cache shared and distributed cache you maintain a directory this directory will store the information that what are the lines which are present with core 0 what are the lines which are present with core 1 and the approximate state of that why approximate because once it goes into the private cache the particular core can do anything with that line it might modify it might evict it it might do anything with that line it might read it or it might share it between the threads of that uh, core whatever it might uh, do it can do private inside the cache and that will not be visible to the shared cache so in a sense it is approximate but it is accurate with respect to the global scenario okay so once it keeps this state information any request from any other core for sharing the shared cache is to is supposed to resolve the coherence and return back the appropriate state to the requesting core okay so this is how snoopy based and directory based coherence protocols are in, uh, implemented the basic idea is that in a snoopy based coherence protocol you have a bus and all the cores are connected onto that bus and one core looks at what is happening with the other cores whereas in a directory based scenario you don't have a snoopy system that means that one core does not hear to the other core it is the shared cache which keeps the approximate state information of all the lines which are present with the private caches and try to resolve the coherence problem there itself and it reverts back to the requesting core with the appropriate state information so your directory uh, directory protocol is why is it uh, more efficient because in a snoopy based coherence protocol what happens is all the cores are listening to it that means that whatever transaction you do should be visible to the other cores that means all the cores are act active whenever there is a transaction on the bus but in a directory based protocol all the cores need not look at what is happening over the network they just assume that the shared cache is going to take care of the coherence Any doubts till this point? Before we move at uh, move into the coherence protocols by itself. Okay, so let's start with the first and the basic, most basic uh, coherence protocol, uh, or which is which has initially designed as Snoopy Cache Coherence Protocol. Which is otherwise known as MSI protocol. So, as the three letters stands for name of three different states, M stands for modified state, S stands for shared state, I stands for invalid state. Let's discuss the name of the states first, and then we'll go at what are the inputs and how is the transaction happening on this uh, state machine and what kind of thing is required in terms of verification 
so i'll start introducing verification slowly from this slide okay so now as we discussed earlier i means invalid state that means that the line is not present inside the cache we already saw m m means modified state that means that the line is present inside the cache and it has seen one write operation at least one write operation now we had something called as valid state or a clean state where we said previously in a uh, write allocate cache uh, we saw that uh, we had a clean state but there we kind of said that we have a line we have brought into the cache but we have not modified it yet we change the name of that uh, clean as shared when two cores starts sharing the line that means that you have two different cores let's say c0 and c1 and let's say when you implement a snoopy protocol then if the first core pulls the line into the first cache uh, into its own private cache it pulls it as shared state and whenever the second core pulls that line it will get it either from the first core or from the memory and it will also install it in shared state now whenever one of them wants to modify it that means it has to do a write operation they have to get the permission to do the write operation now to get the uh, uh, permission what we have to do for that we have to understand each of these transitions now first of all we start with an invalid state so we understood what are the meanings of these three state we start with an invalid state in an invalid state if you are going to do a processor read what is going to happen is it is going to generate a get s what does get s means it means that you go to the memory or go to the bus and get me the shared line so upon the return of the shared line you are going to move into a shared state that's what i meant by pulling the data from the memory into the cache and installing it in a shared state so whenever there was a processor read whenever there was a processor read so there was a miss because i was in i state and then i generated the cache generated a get s which ensured that it pulls in line from somewhere i don't know where either from some other core or from the memory it just sends a signal to the bus saying that you get me the line and whenever the bus returns the line it installs the line in a shared state now at shared state if i am going to do a read i am going to stay at the same state we'll not look at what is happening on the right right side what's happening on the right now we'll first discuss what will happen if i am having let's say let's assume that you and me are the two different cores and let's say i am i am the uh, core 0 and you are core 1 and i am using the line i pulled it into my own cache and now i have installed it into into my cache as shared state now you started pulling it and when you started pulling it you got a miss because you you, you not, did not had the line so you were in i state for that particular line now because you were in i you generated a miss because you generated a miss again you generated get s when you generated get s you look at the bus, the get s goes to the bus and because let's say let's assume a snoopy coherence protocol because i am also connected to the same bus i am snooping on the bus then i am supposed to say that i have the line so if i have the line so there is one transition probably missing here that is get us this one because i have 
the line in shared state i am supposed to give you back the line i am going to give you the line but i am going to stay in the shared state so after getting get us response back you will also go into shared state so now you for the same data item you have the line in shared state i also have the line in shared state okay now after that if you start reading from your own cache you will get hit same time if i am also reading from my own cache i will also get a hit and no one will have the problem and we are both both of us are very happy but the problem starts when you start or i start writing into it the moment i start writing into it let's say i start writing into it the moment i start writing into it i will generate a processor read because i am in shared state i cannot write into the cache because if i write into the cache it might not be visible to you so for that i need to get permission from you go and get uh, give me this permission so that i can write into the cache so as i ask you for permission i will say get me m state to the bus now the moment the transaction reaches bus you are also listening to the bus you will see the transaction that there is a get m signal you you are in shared state now you will see that oh the other core is saying that he needs a line in the modified state so i have to give him the line but if i give him the line i cannot retain the line so that means that i am going to transit back into invalid state so you are going to invalidate your own cache and you are going to give me the get m signal the moment i get the get m signal i will go into modified state and i can do the right there okay now the other scenario is i don't even have the line but i am asking i am trying to do a processor line right let's say you just have the line i don't have the line and i want to do processor right so in that case also i will generate a get m the moment you will see a get m so you you let's say you are in shared state you will see a get m you will move to invalid state and you will give the line to me as you give the line to me i will move into modified state okay so at a given point of time only one core can have the line in modified state but more than one core can have the line in a shared state if we are in if one of the core is in modified state if they are doing read or write after that they are not changing the state because that is local i am in modified state and i am doing a read no one else is doing a read right so i can just do a read from my local cache similarly if i am doing a write i am not affecting any other because the protocol ensures that i have the local copy so if we are doing a processor read or processor write then we are not making any state transitions we are staying in the modified state now another scenario might come where i am having something in a modified state let's say i i started writing and i got the permission i wrote it and now i am in modified state now at that point of time what might happen is like you start again requesting for the same line but now you are doing a read so you were in i because you gave the line back to me so you were in i and now you wanted to do read again the moment you started to do read again you will say get me s and that get s comes to me in modified state because i am also listening to the bus i get the line in m from m state i have the line in m state so i will listen to the bus and i will see a getter get us transaction when i see a getter transaction what i will do is i will move back to shared state 
and i will give you back the line so upon that what you will do is you will get back the line and you will also install the line in shared state but the interesting thing is here is that because i am moving from modified to shared and you are moving from invalid to shared the right information the right which i did is getting lost so while doing this transition i will send a write back to the main memory so now after this what is going to happen is all the things are synced that means that you have a shared copy i have a shared copy and main memory is also updated with the latest copy which uh, which has already seen that particular write okay so this is how the msi protocol works now the most important thing is what it takes to implement this protocol i mean understanding this protocol is something and then going ahead and implementing this protocol it's not that trivial right so we need to ensure that we do not miss any case so for that we have to come up with the properties of the protocol what do we mean by properties of a protocol what what are the examples of properties of a protocol now one of the property that i said uh, while in discussion was you only one of the core will have the line in modified state correct so if one of the core is having the line in modified state that means that if somehow due to some coding errors or modeling errors or whatever you did a mistake and you installed m state into two different cores then it is going to go wrong so the property is that at no point of time two cores can have the line in modified state similarly if similarly you can say if you look at the table on the left hand side these are the combination of states which are possible between the two cores so you cannot have modified modified in two cores you similarly you cannot have modified and shared combination you can have shared and shared combination this is correct so modified and shared and modified and modified are not allowed all the other conditions or combinations are allowed that means that you cannot have a modified copy as well as i cannot have a modified copy so at the same time you cannot have a shared copy and i cannot have a modified copy so these kind of properties are called safety properties so the system is safe the coherence the data is safe if this combination of states are not possible if we are ensuring that our implementation is satisfying the way we implement however we implement if we ensure that at no point of time two m states are not possible or one m state and one s state is not possible that is kind of called as safety property okay so while implementing a coherence protocol you need to check this property first i am going to discuss only few of the properties Um, uh, as as the coherence protocol gets more and more complex more and more properties will come into play the other property that you can think of one is one category is safety property the other category is liveness property now what is a liveness property liveness means that the system is live that means that it is not getting stuck anywhere what does that means that means that if you are sending a read request always you are going to get a response back similarly if you are doing a write operation your main memory should see a write transaction in the end so 
in this example as as i discussed this coherence example with you i i i was trying to write on to a line and uh, you were on the other side who had the line in a shared state now you started again reading that same line but since i had the modified uh, copy i had to supply you that line but at that point of time both of us transited into shared state and the right was missing we have to ensure that the main memory absorbs that right so that's the property if i have done at least one write for that particular address then the main memory should absorb that right at some point of time in future if main memory is not observing that right at some point of time in future then there is some mistake in the implementation of the protocol okay so there are two categories of property typically we verify in any system one is safety property the other is liveness property in a safety property combination of states are seen uh, which combination is possible which combination is not possible and in liveness property we see that a particular transaction that we made is not getting lost anywhere okay so another example of liveness property is a very simple property that if you trigger a read someone is going to supply you the data either it will be some other core or it will be main memory someone will supply you the data that means that you are never waiting for that line in an indefinite manner so that means that you will never get a time out for that particular request at any point of time okay so that's another kind of liveness property okay so let's go into uh, the next protocol which is one of the most commonly used protocol otherwise known as messi protocol m e s i protocol now uh, in the previous uh, slide we saw msi protocol in msi protocol what happens is a valid line always means shared so for example again let's go back to the example that you are one of the core and i am one of the core so let's say i am using a line and i pull it into my own cache it's a valid line i don't want to modify it let's say i i have not modified it i don't want to modify it is wrong term i i have not modified it yet so as i pull it into my own cache what happens is i install the line in a shared state because it has got three different state i cannot install it in modified state and i i can never tag that as invalid i have the line so it has to be valid so invalid i have got two choices either to make it as uh, uh, modified or to make it as shared i cannot make it as modified because it will again generate a uh, transaction back on the main memory when it will be evicted so i cannot make it modified so i have to install it in shared state so now if i am installing it in shared state what is happening just imagine all those lines which are not shared there will be thousands lakhs and lakhs of lines which will not be shared but since i am installing them in shared state whenever i have to do a write i have to send a transaction on the bus to get me the permission to write on to it although the line is never is uh, it is never going to be shared i am always generating a write transaction on the bus such that i have to get the permission to write on to it so in that way what is going to happen is unnecessary transactions are going to be generated on the bus what will happen on the, to this first of all network traffic will go second all the if it is a snoopy uh, coherence protocol all the other caches will be unnecessarily looking at some transaction on the bus they will probe their own cache 
not to find the line. So it will create bottlenecks on the on the other caches also, which are not having the line. So to get around this problem, we need to have a mechanism where we have to represent that one particular line is brought from the memory into one of the private caches and has not been shared at this point of time. Now to represent that, we use a state which is known as called as exclusive state. We add a state to MSI protocol, which removes this unnecessary traffic flow by introducing something called as exclusive state. Okay, so now let's look at the new protocol, which is known as MESI protocol. Okay, so again, invalid means the same, shared means the same, modified means the same. We introduce exclusive to say that the line is now brought in, into the cache and it is not shared by other processors and it is not modified yet. So let's look at the transactions. You, again, let's look at a thing that you are one of the processor and I am one of the processor. Both of us are, let's say right now, for that same particular address, no one is having the line. So both of us are in invalid state. You are in invalid state, I am in invalid state. I am, I generated a read. When I generated a read, what I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a, I'm going to have a miss because I'm in I state. Because I got a miss, I will generate a bus read signal. Now, when the bus read signal goes over the bus, now for, for the first time it will go and check uh, that no other core is having the line. So it will go to the memory, get the line. So if it is going to the memory and getting the line, then it is going to install the line in an exclusive state. So this is S bar, not shared. If the response from the bus is not shared, then you are going to install the line in an exclusive state. If the response from the bus is, is the line with shared information, then you are going to travel back into the shared state. That means that let's say you have the line, you already have the line and I am making a read. So the bus will find that you have the line. So you have to revert back to me as in the previous protocol and you are going to give me the line in the shared state. You are going to stay in the shared state and you are going to give me the line in the shared state. But if you are not having the line, then it is going to go to the memory, bring back the line and give, it, give the line to me in a exclusive state. That means that I only, after this transaction completes, it means that I only have the line and I have not modified it yet. Okay, so now at E state, if you are trying to do a read, you can do that. It's just a self loop. And at E state, now if you, are, if you want to do a write, now you do not generate any bus transaction. You simply write onto it and make it as modified state. And as in modified state, if you are doing a read or a write, you just stay in that state. But if you are in shared state, you are going to read, no problem. But if you are going to write, then again, you have to get a permission over the bus. And the moment the bus gives a signal that, okay, the other core has invalidated the copy, then you are going to get a line in the modified state. Okay, so with E state, what we are doing here is that we are optimizing this particular transaction, a write onto the line when we are in exclusive state. When we are in exclusive state, we can just do a write onto it without sending any transaction over the bus. 
and shared state anyways takes care of the other part that if you have the line in shared state then it is going to ensure that the protocol the coherence protocol is followed and it is going to ensure the consistency of the data okay so now as we have understood the protocol now the important thing is understanding the property associated with the protocol now as with the previous protocol there we said that we need to have if only one core can have the line in modified state here we can say that only one core can have the line either in exclusive state or modified state okay so by that what we mean that two cores cannot have a combination of m state anyways messi protocol was also not uh, sorry msi protocol was not also allowing this it was also not allowing the combination of m and h states now with that we add a few more thing we add that combination of e and m is also not allowed that means that means that one core cannot have the line in e state and other core while the other core is having the line in m state so one core is if it is having the line in e state other core cannot have the line in m state similarly if one core is having the line in e state other core can cannot also have the line in e state at the same time if one of the core is having the line in e state it cannot be in s state in any other core while every other type of combination is possible that means that two s states are possible and combination of any state with i state is possible so while implementing a coherence protocol the safety properties can be specified using this similarly what could be the liveness property one of the extra liveness property can be that you were in e state and when you did a write later point of time the main memory is going to observe a write back so that's another kind of liveness property that needs to be verified for a messy protocol so is this fine uh, dr colin uh, do we need to have a short break yes we can give a short break okay so we'll kind of i i'll be there if anyone wants any questions uh, i can take it but it's uh, it's a break for the audience we'll start again at uh, 620 maybe yeah 5 7 minutes of break any questions it's open any questions regarding this i can take up uh, sir can you please explain the massive part once messy protocol messy uh, protocol again is it no sir massive the f1 yeah yeah that i will uh, discuss after uh, the uh, break so okay, i'll sir. discuss two more protocol one is massive and uh, one is moisy okay sir sure
Okay, let's start 6.20. <laughs> okay, so uh, we kind of understood uh, that uh, the messy protocol. Now I'm going to discuss two more protocols which are most commonly used. Uh, the first one is MESIF protocol, which was uh, proposed by Intel. And the second one is MEOSI protocol, which was proposed by AMD. Uh, so again, we understood what is messy, right? So now imagine a scenario where there are multiple cores. Just imagine that, that the same scenario that we were discussing that you and me were two different cores. Now imagine that two more people are there and they are also competing for the same line. So they want, they also want the same data. It's a very hot data and they want the same data. And uh, what happens is, uh, let's say all, all three of you have the line. And I am the only person who don't have, you know, who does not have the line. I am in I state and all three of you are in S state. Now, but now I want you, want the line. So I, I, I generated a read because of which uh, there was a miss because I was in I state. And uh, after that, uh, uh, you uh, my cache generated a get, get s. Now the moment get s goes onto the bus, what will happen is all three of you will come back and say that, oh, we have the line. All three of you will come back and say that we have the line. Now the bus has to make a decision from whom I should get the line. Now, in a typical MESI protocol, MESI protocol, what will happen is all the three will say that we have the line, then the bus will have to do an arbitration to choose anyone at random or with respect to some algorithm and it will return back the data from that core to me. But what is going to happen there is there is a confusion that who is going to supply the data. Otherwise, if the bus starts allowing everyone to supply the data, it will cause bus uh, congestion. So in that case, what uh, MESIF protocol does is it introduces one more state by introducing a new state called as F state or forwarder state. What is a forwarder state? It is otherwise known as another shared state. Remember, forwarder state is again a shared state, but with a privilege that whenever there will be a get S transaction, forwarder core is the only core which is going to reply back with the data. And now who will be chosen as for a forwarder for the next transaction? The one who received the data last will be chosen as the forwarder core in a bus-based coherence, uh, Snoopy-based coherency protocol. In a network protocol, it may not be true. There, there are more optimizations to it. I will not go into that uh, directory based protocol. In a Snoopy based coherence protocol, a shared F is a shared state where whenever the cache which is having the line in F state is going to receive a get S signal is the core who is going to revert back with the line. The other caches which are having the line in shared state along with this if state are not going to revert back. That means that let's say the same, the scenario where you three are having the line, only one of you, you three are having the line in shared state, only one of you will be marked as forwarder. In your forwarder, if you are in a forwarder state, then you are the person who is going to revert back with the line. The other two are just going to keep quiet. 
Okay. So this way you can optimize your network traffic. So, but then what is the thing that needs to be verified here? The combination of what states is now more possible. As I said, F state is another shared state. So combination of S and F is possible. Combination of S and F is possible and combination of M, E, M or E and F is not possible. Okay. So does that explain MESIF protocol? Yes, sir. Okay, so we'll move, move to uh, Moisey. Okay, so now imagine the same scenario. We have implemented a messy protocol and uh, what happened is like, uh, I, a lot of you had the line. So let's imagine the same scenario where uh, four of us are there and uh, we are sharing the same line. Uh, all four, let's, let's assume the scenario now that all the four of us have the line. That means that all four of us are having the line in a shared state. Now, let's say I want to write onto it. What I will do? I will generate a processor write. The moment I receive a processor write and I hit up shared state, I will say, get me M to the bus. What bus will do? It will go ahead and inform all the other cores and all the other cores will invalidate their lines and give me the permission to update my line as modified copy. That's what happens, right? So now after the transaction completes, I will have the line in modified state and all the other cores will have the line in invalid state. That means that they won't have the line. Now at this point of time, I have the line in end state and you start pulling it again. So what I had to do, I had to send you back the line at the same time, I had to update the main memory, right? Because we were losing the right information. That means that with every sharing after the first write has occurred, we were losing the shared information if we were not writing it back to the main memory. But imagine that it is a very hot line which is getting shared among all the cores and it is getting modified by all the cores. What is going to happen? The moment there will be sharing, there will be a write back going into the memory which is going to increase the memory traffic. So how to do about it? Introduce another state. That's what AMD did. So they introduced the own state, which means that it the line is shared, whereas it is at modified at least once. So line is shared. That means that it is same across all the cores, but at least one write has been seen from the point it was brought from the memory. Okay, so you got the data from the memory. You did some sharing, you moved around in the shared state. After that, you invalidated all the, all the other codes, got the line in exclusive state and modified it. After that, if someone else wants the data, give the data in a own state. Remember that only one of the core will have the line in own state and all the other cores will have the line in shared state. But the core which is having the line in own state is responsible to write it back to the main memory whenever it is evicted completely. Okay. So this way, what we are doing is 
we are merging all the writes from all the cores and committing into the memory as one transaction not multiple transactions so it is going to reduce the uh, memory traffic it is going to reduce the number of writes going into the memory for the same address which is getting shared and moving around in inside the cache okay so now in terms of safety properties again let's go back to the safety properties so by by own state we are introducing basically dirty sharing by dirty sharing what we are doing is we are keeping track that this line was made dirty by someone but after that it has been shared so any one of the core has to maintain this information that this line is dirty i need to write it back to the main memory while the other cores can just think that it is a shared line so the same get s and get m signals the same get s and get m signal will be similar with the way they work with the shared state but the moment you evict the line from the own state it has to send the line into the main memory that is the idea behind own state okay so now for the safety property what is the combination again as i said o is a shared state so combination of o and s is possible combination of s and s is possible combination of o and s is possible and combination of s and s is possible whereas combination of two different os is also not possible because there can be only one core who should hold the line in o state and that core is the core which is responsible for writing the line into the main memory and again as as normal two m states are not possible m and e are e are not possible anyways m and s are not possible so since m and s are not possible m and o are not possible now and since e and s are not possible e and s were not possible so since e and s were not possible now o and e are also not possible and anyways two e's are also not possible combination of any of these state with i is always possible so these are the set of safety properties that has to be ensured now what can be a liveness property again that if there is only one if there is a, at least one write then main memory should see that write at some point of time in the future it should not happen that the write got vanished okay so we looked at various uh, protocols that those are implemented on cpus now let's look at let's touch upon what are the coherence protocols that those are working on cpu on the gpu as well as the coherence that is working between the cpu and the gpu so you might let's say you might be running a gaming application uh, your uh, game might be running on the cpu as well as at at the run time it will get offloaded onto the gpu so that might be sharing of the data now typically with a dedicated cpu gpu coherence the coherence is managed by the system software or the operating system or the driver you can see at this point of time i say that the gpu driver is supposed to take care of this coherence scenario it cannot be handled via the uh, hardware that's because of the pci slots that's because that your dedicated gpu is kind of 
considered as a kind of a device okay so since it's a device it has to be handled by the driver in a integrated gpu what do you mean by integrated gpu the let's say this is a cpu this this is a cpu complex by cpu complex we mean that about eight cpus form a complex similarly there can be another complex of eight cpus and they might be connected over the network this is this is otherwise the north bridge and this connects to the main memory so if it is let's say a 16 core system so then there are cluster two clusters of eight cpus each and the coherence between the cpu is taken care of inside a cluster these cpus be taken care of inside the cluster and the coherence between this cpu and this set of cpus and this set of cpus will be taken care of via the north bridge so there will be a directory which will be installed here so which will take care of the coherence between this cluster and this cluster now gpu can and can be another set of cluster the gpu cores can be another set of cluster in a integrated gpu environment so by integrated gpu there can it can be um, examples of integrated gpus are uh, your amd apus accelerated processing unit or intel uh, irish gpus so they are connected both the cpu cluster and the gpu cluster are connected uh, to this hub and the coherence between them right now is taken again managed by the software system software or operating system but hardware coherence features are getting explored that means that there is research going around to maintain hardware coherence between the cpu and the gpu one of the hardware coherence protocol which has been explored in the open community is the viper protocol by the gem5 group gem5 it, it's a it's a project in collaboration with amd and gem5 group so they explored the viper protocol in viper protocol what they do is like to maintain a coherence between the cpu and the gpu via hardware without the involvement of any system software now what about coherence inside the gpu G inside the gpu it is the the number of memory transactions are so high that we cannot go ahead with a very very robust and uh, correct coherence protocol there so we have to implement a loosely uh, accurate protocol which is all otherwise known as a loose write through protocol with invalidation signals so that means that at some point of time we have to just assume that if there is some sharing between the cores inside the cpu uh, gpu then we cannot do anything i mean if if someone starts modifying it we might actually get some wrong results but typically the it is the responsibility of the application programmer to divide the data in such a way that that can be minimum minimal sharing but if there is a sharing then you have to implement your own locking mechanism to ensure that the coherence is taken care of by the application by itself or the system software of the gpu or the driver now uh, i want to just touch upon how exactly verification is being done and what are the methods of doing verification and i'm going to take a very simple case study of using victim cache so as i discussed previously there are three types of caches uh, in terms of designing hierarchical class cache 
they can be inclusive cash they can be exclusive cash or they can be non inclusive cash now victim cash is designed only as exclusive cash or non inclusive cash now let's see what is a victim cash now there can be two uh, types uh, of cashes one is conventional cash hierarchy other is victim cash hierarchy so here there are three two levels of cash i am calling them as predecessor cash and conventional cash in uh, one layer one uh, in the conventional side and predecessor cash and victim cash in another design okay so in a conventional design what will happen is if there is a predecessor cash miss then a request will be generated on the conventional cash and upon a miss again it will go into successor memory which can be the main memory and whenever there is a fill you are going to fill the conventional cash first and then you are going to do a predecessor fill similarly when we are going to do a write back from the predecessor cash you are going to write it on to the conventional cash and whenever there is a write back from the conventional cash it will go to the main memory in contrast in a victim cash design what happens is you have a predecessor cash you send a request upon a miss and upon a miss in the victim cash again the request is forwarded to the main memory so the request data path is the same whereas the response data path is different in a response data path of a conventional cash you were filling the conventional cash first and then the predecessor cash but here you directly fill the predecessor cash upon a miss from the victim cash you do not talk to the victim cash from the successor memory you directly fill the predecessor cash only when the predecessor cash is going to evict the line it is going to evict the line you are going to fill the victim cash so this victim cash is getting filled with the eviction of the line from the predecessor cash but if we are going to hit if, if if there is a request from the predecessor cash and it hits the victim cash you are going to fill the line as it is okay so that means that there is no direct data path from the succession memory to the victim cash so the victim cash is only getting filled by the predecessor cash okay so this is the design of a victim cash now let's look at how to uh represent it using sorry we will see how to represent it uh, using state machines but before that i will go into the importance of verification okay so why do we need to do verification first is correctness of state transition in the single cache level verification of coherence protocol by the way first is correctness in state transition in a single cache level correctness in state transition due to interaction with other caches so as i was discussing the protocols i i was doing something it was affecting you and you were doing something which was affecting me so we need to have a correctness in the state transition between whatever we are doing then whatever is happening with the local class uh, cache is one thing but the data correctness should be correct with respect to the global system and there can be race conditions also because of timing what can be race condition that you are doing something you might be evicting something you might be uh, writing at one point of time at the same time i am trying to do something with uh, your data so let's say i am trying to send a get a signal or uh, get a signal at the same time you might be doing uh, read or the write on the same particular data item so there is a race condition that which particular transaction should be processed first so we need to handle the race condition also similarly there can be transient incorrect states for example you might be doing something and you might be evicting the line at one point of time so while evicting the line you might have some transient states 
whatever we saw in terms of the state machines, those are the concrete states, but there can be intermediate transient states. Now, th there can be scenarios where your global system correctness might be affected because of this transient conditions. So we need to ensure that at not, no point in the time, because of this transient incorrect states, we might actually see something wrong at uh, some sometime in the future. For example, we have we we discussed about inclusiveness property, right? What is inclusiveness property? L1 cache is a subset of L2 cache, right? So now imagine a scenario where L1 had this line and L2 had the same line here. L1 has evicted it just evicted it and this eviction information has to be updated in L2. That I have evicted it, L1 has evicted it, this information has to be updated in L2. This is a transient, it might take two to three cycles, let's say. Within this two to three cycle, our inclusiveness property is not valid, right? Because we have evicted the line, but that information has not been updated here. Because of timing scenarios, it might happen that we might be in some transient states and we might be in a wrong state. But what should happen is after the transaction should become a transaction completes, we should not go into a wrong state. Okay, so we need to take care of these things in the protocol also, which might not be directly visible uh, as we are kind of drawing these state machines. Now, of course, verification is important because of the complexity of the system. It, the moment you start implementing the protocol, there will be so much of race condition and so much of scalability issues that the system becomes really complex to understand and to find specific properties associated with it. So we need to have, we need to figure out proper properties such that we are able to verify the complex system effectively. Now, the other thing is how much time we will take to verify the system and what is the coverage? What do you mean by coverage? How many test cases that we did, we kind of generated to ensure that we kind of verified the system accurately. So how much time we did took for verification and what is our verification coverage? Those are the two most important uh, things which we should consider while doing the verification of a coherent system. Now, what are the techniques and channel challenges? One of the most common technique used is formal verification or model checking. So this I will discuss in short. Uh, the other types of verification is equivalence checking, runtime verification and runtime enforcement. I will come to this once I kind of go through formal verification. Now, what we do in formal verification? In formal verification, first of all, we have a design that needs to be modeled. Now, after that, we collect requirements. Now, design to be modeled here can be, or in our case, will be the MESI protocol or the MOISI protocol or whatever protocol we want to verify. Now, after that, we have to collect the requirements. What are the requirements? These requirements are otherwise just standard statements that two different caches cannot be in M state or E state, or there cannot be combination of M state or S states. So those are the requirements of your protocol. We will list down all those requirements. After that, we went for modeling, right? we went for modeling and came up with those state machines that we discussed. At the same time, we'll come up with properties from whatever requirements we had and we represented using, we represented it using linear temporal logic. I'll show you what exactly is a linear temporal logic in the coming slides. We'll represent the properties in linear temporal logic and we drew the state machine and we encode the state machine in some formal verification tool. Here, uh, I have been using SAL, Symbolic Analysis Laboratory code. 
we encode it using formal verification tool and then give it to the model checker. We, we take the code, the uh, representation of the state machine and the LTL uh, 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 properties and give it to the model checker. Now, the model checker will check the model against the property. Now, if the property satisfies the model, it is fine. It will say it is validated. Otherwise, what it is going to do, it is going to generate a counterexample. That, okay, if you go via this set of test cases, it is this property is failing against this model. Now, you have to go and check if the model is wrong or your property is wrong. So in this figure, I miss, I'm missing this particular arrow, either remodel or regenerate property. Now the disadvantage of doing this formal verification is that if you both, if you have gen designed a wrong model, as well as you have written a wrong property, and by chance the property is getting through the model, then it is not getting caught. So false, false scenario, that is a problem. If this is false, this is true, it will catch it. This is false, uh, this is true, this is false, it will catch it. True, true, it will say validated, but if it is false, false, should have ca caught it, but it is going to say validated. It might say validated, it, it might not say validated, it might say validated. Okay, so this is how a typical formal verification setup looks like. Now, as we discuss the state machine, uh, the design of the victim cache, now we can represent the victim cache as the state machines of the predecessor cache and the victim cache. So the left hand side is the state machine of the predecessor cache. The right hand side is the state machine of the victim cache. I'm not going to go into the complete details of all the transitions here, but what I'm going to explain here is the property of uh, how, how we are going to come up with the property here and how do we kind of verify it. Now, we discussed about the inclusiveness, exclusiveness, uh, exclusiveness property and non-inclusiveness property. In our design, in this particular victim cache design, we are considering a non-inclusive victim cache. That means that some lines can be inclusive and some lines can be exclusive. So we are assuming in this case that if a line is inclusive, that means that if it is present in the predecessor cache, it is present in the victim cache. But it can be exclusive, it can be pre present in the predecessor cache only. Okay. So to do that, we introduce different states. The first state can be inclusive, inclusive and clean, which means that it is clean. That means it has not been modified in the predecessor cache and it is clean and it is inclusive. That means that it is present in the victim cache. It is present in the victim cache. That means that it will be either in clean state in the victim cache or in, or will be in modified state. Similarly, it can be inclusive and modified. That means that inclusive means it is present in the victim cache. That means that if I am present in IM state in predecessor cache that it should be the thing that I will be present in clean or modified state in the victim cache. But I have modified the line here. But that can be two more states where it can be, it, it is saying that it is exclusive clean and exclusive modified. That means that only predecessor cache has the line. And if it is clean that it will be in, uh, exclusive uh, clean state. And if it is modified, then it can be in exclusive modified state. Okay. So with this, what it means that if I am in EC state or EM state, since I am only holding the line, then the victim cache must be in I state. So these are the properties that we need to verify. 
so to property uh, to verify the inclusiveness property what we are saying is if the predecessor cache state is inclusive clean or inclusive modi uh, modified then the victim cache state cannot be i somehow my pen is no no more working but that's okay we are almost reaching at the end so the victim cache state cannot be clean or modified similarly if you are in clean or modified state in the victim cache so you should be either in inclusive clean state or inclusive modified state or it you are in invalid state in the predecessor cache so this is the safety of a non inclusive victim cache system this is a safety property of a non inclusive victim cache system this is an ltl where g states that it is globally true g means it is globally true that this property holds okay and after that it is just standard discrete max similarly if we go to liveness of a system what we are saying is we are going to describe a properties known as victim fill what is victim fill if you are going to evict something from the predecessor cache you are going to install it into the victim cache sorry you are going to install it into the victim cache that's the property as victim fill so in that case what is going to happen you might be having the line in ec state you might be having the line in ec state exclusive clean state in the predecessor cache and now you evicted it p evict becomes true and at that point of time you do not generate any write then in future f means in future you are going to see a victim cache fill with a signal called as victim write back from the predecessor cache okay and that victim cache fill will in future write the line into clean state in the victim cache so combination of these two properties victim fill 1 and victim fill 2 will ensure the liveness of the system and this property needs to be verified to verify the functionality of a victim cache so like that there will be several other properties that we need to figure out and represent and verify against the state machine to kind of prove the correctness of the state machine as well as the property now once we have proven the property then we have to go and verify it in the real system to verify it in the real system you have to use a runtime verification to do runtime verification you have to implement the thing in the the model or the protocol in the real setup you have to run benchmarks to hit several cases and you have to use those properties as assertions in your code you have already verified the property using model checking now you have to take those property and embed it into your code and you have to ensure that in the long run this property is satisfied in the real implementation now the question is can we hit all the cases with some set of multi threaded benchmark it may not be possible so we need to design test cases to kind of verify the system verify all these properties that we prove using model checking then i'll just touch upon what is equivalence checking and what is runtime enforcement in equivalence checking what we do is that there are two different implementation uh, let's say uh, typically we use simulation as well as we have rtl uh, rtl is your uh, hardware uh, description the real uh, implementation now you can do an equivalence checking that whatever you implemented in the simulator is implemented in the same thing in the uh rtl uh, model so you have to do an equivalence checking that that whatever your simulator code is doing the same thing is being done by the rtl code so that way you can 
you can find errors in both the models. You can find errors in your simulator model as well as you can find out detect errors in your RTN model because two different people are implementing it and there can be ambiguity, uh, ambiguity in understanding the requirements. So the one person might implement it in one way, the other person might implement it in another way. So if you do a, you are doing an equivalence checking, then you are ensuring that both are on the same page. Now, the last thing is runtime enforcement. In runtime enforcement is a new field of study where what we can do is even if something goes wrong, we did something mistake, some mistake, and that is irreversible, then we can introduce new modules that can detect things at the runtime and embed the correct information and correct the protocol at the runtime. So let's say you, you designed a chip which had some mistake in their protocol, then you, uh, but you taped out the chip, then what you can do is you can embed another chip by correcting this information. What it will, it will do is it will look at what is going wrong and it will correct this information and send it back. So that means if you are, let's say you, at some point of time, two exclusive states are remaining in, in two different cache, what it will do is it will immediately invalidate one of the copies. Okay, so cache coherence research directions. Uh, so as I discussed that CPU GPU coherence optimization is an open traffic because of different streaming traffic. Uh, cache coherence verification techniques is an open uh, research direction. Predicting the degree of uh, sharing patterns of large scale system is again a very open domain of uh, research. Uh, uh, predicting the sharing pattern uh, across various cores and CPUs is again an interesting uh, way. CXL protocol is a new protocol which is growing now. Uh, so it is brought in to get a common handshake between different vendors. So exploring those directions are also important. And of course, co uh, coherence traffic optimization in interconnection networks is, uh, is kind of uh, being very famous and it's running around for a longer time now. So these are the major coherence, cache coherence research directions. So if anyone is interested, they can work on it. So finally, the last slide I have is uh, something which is very personal to me. <laughs> so there, there are several openings at IIT Roorkee. If uh, you, you are interested to do research in any of these directions. So some things which are related to architectural uh, focus, architectural focus uh, research related to caches, uh, cache coherence for, uh, performance and uh, verification studies, TD, TD stack cache coherence uh, verifications, special GPU caches verification. Uh, similarly, interconnection networks design, 2D and 3D interconnection network design. Uh, GPU, I'm, uh, we are kind of uh, also, uh, I'm also working on the GPU front end uh, pipeline and the graphics pipeline by itself. So understanding the graphics pipeline uh, technique understanding the graphics pipeline by itself and doing optimization on top of that. Uh, then uh, we are also in, in our lab. Uh, this particular thing is done in collaboration. Uh, we are exploring machine learning techniques for prediction of computer architecture data. So simulation data runs for very long time. So we want to do data prediction uh, using machine learning. So if you are a machine learning enthusiast, uh, then you are also open. So simulator development, uh, we are looking for interns uh, with C++ skill for implementation of uh, cache controller as well as uh, uh, interconnection network controllers. Uh, we are the electronics department uh, of IIT Roorkee. We, we have been thinking of development of IP, IP purpose also. So uh, we are looking for system C, system Verilog and Verilog interns also in that direction. And uh, so looking for interns, mostly for the ML work and uh, also uh, PhD scholars starting from January, 2023. That's it, thank you from me. Any questions I'm open to take? We are almost over the time. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
thanks Devi Prasanna. Thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Devi Prasanna. Thank you, Kalan. We'll stop. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah.